And now chapter 3 of the Antialila, The Glories of Srila Haridas Thakur. I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master and of all the other preceptors on the path of devotional service, unto all the Vaishnavas and unto the six Goswamis, including Srila Rupa Goswami, Srila Sanatan Goswami, Raghunath Das Goswami, Jiva Goswami, and their associates. I offer my respectful obeisances unto Sri Advaita Acharya Prabhu, Sri Nityananda Prabhu, and Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, as well as all his devotees headed by Sri Vas Thakur. I then offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of Lord Krishna and Sri Mati Radharani, and all the gopis headed by Lalita and Vishaka. All glories to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, all glories to Nityananda Prabhu, all glories to Advaita Charya and all glories to all the devotees of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. In Jagannath Puri there was a young boy who had been born of an Orissan Brahmin, but had later lost his father. The boy's features were very beautiful, and his behavior was extremely gentle. The boy came daily to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and offered him respectful obeisances. He was free to talk with Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu because the Lord was his life and soul. But the boy's intimacy with the Lord and the Lord's mercy toward him were intolerable to Damodar Pandit. Damada Pandit again and again forbade the son of the Brahmin to visit the Lord, but the boy could not bear staying home and not seeing Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The boy came every day to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who treated him with great affection. It is the nature of any boy to go see a man who loves him. This was intolerable for Damada Pandit. He became greatly unhappy, but there was nothing he could say, for the boy would ignore his restrictions. One day, when the boy came to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Lord very affectionately inquired from him about all kinds of news. After some time, when the boy stood up and left, the intolerant Damada Pandit began to speak. Damada Pandit impudently said to the Lord, Everyone says that you are a great teacher because of your instructions to others, but now we shall find out what kind of teacher you are. You are known as Goshani, or teacher, or Acharya, but now talk about your attributes and reputation will spread throughout the city of Purushottam, how your position will be impaired. Although Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu knew that Damada Pandit was a pure and simple devotee, upon hearing this impudent talk, the Lord said, my dear Damodar, what nonsense are you speaking? Damodar Pandit replied, You are the independent personality of Godhead, beyond all criticism. My dear Lord, you can act as you please. No one can say anything to restrict you. Nevertheless, the entire world is impudent. People can say anything. How can you stop them? Dear Lord, you are a learned teacher. Why then don't you consider that this boy is the son of a widowed Brahmani. Why are you so affectionate to him? Although the boy's mother is completely austere and chaste, she has one natural fault. <laughs> she is a very beautiful young girl, and you, my dear Lord, are a handsome, attractive young man. Therefore, certainly people will whisper about you. Why should you give them such an opportunity? 
Having said this, Damada Pandit became silent. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu smiled, pleased within himself, and considered the impudence of Damada Pandit. This impudence is also a sign of pure love for me. I have no other intimate friend like Damada Pandit. Thinking in this way, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went to perform his noon duties. The next day he called Damada Pandit to a solitary place. The Lord said, My dear friend Damadar, you had better go to Nadia and stay with my mother. I see no one but you to protect her, for you are so careful that you can caution even me. You are the most neutral among my associates. This is very good, for without being neutral one cannot protect religious principles. You can do whatever I cannot. Indeed, you can chastise even me not to speak of others. It is best for you to go to the shelter of my mother's lotus feet, for no one will be able to behave independently in front of you. At intervals you may come see me here, and then soon again go there. Offer my mother millions of my obeisances. Please speak to her about my happiness here, and thus give her happiness. Tell her that I sent you to inform her of my personal activities, so that she may share in my happiness. Speaking in this way, satisfy the mind of Mother Shachi. Also remind her of one most confidential incident with this message from me. I come to your home again and again to eat all the sweetmeats and vegetables you offer. You know that I come and eat the offerings, but because of external separation you consider this a dream. During the last Mug Sankranti festival you cooked varieties of vegetables, condensed milk, cakes and sweet rice for me. You offered the food to Lord Krishna, and while you were in meditation I suddenly appeared and your eyes filled with tears. I went there in great haste and ate everything. When you saw me eating you felt great happiness. In a moment after you had wiped your eyes you saw that the plate you had offered me was empty. Then you thought, I dreamt as if Nimai were eating everything. In the condition of external separation you were again under illusion, thinking that you had not offered the food to Lord Vishnu. Then you went to see the cooking pots and found that every pot was filled with food. Therefore you again offered the food after cleansing the place for the offering. Thus I again and again eat everything you offer me, for I am attracted by your pure love. Only by your order am I living in Nilachal. Nevertheless, you still pull me near you because of your great love for me. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told Damodar Pandit, Remind Mother Shachi in this way again and again, and worship her lotus feet in my name. After saying this, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ordered that varieties of prasad offered to Lord Jagannath be brought. The Lord then gave him the prasad separately packed to offer to various Vaishnavs and his mother. In this way, Damodar Pandit went to Nadia or Navadvip. After meeting Mother Shachi, he stayed under the care of her lotus feet. He delivered all the prasad to such great Vaishnavs as Advaitacharya. Thus he stayed there and behaved according to the order of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Everyone knew that Damodar Pandit was strict in practical dealings. Therefore everyone was afraid of him and dared not to do anything independent. Damodar Pandit would verbally chastise every devotee of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu whom he found deviating even slightly from proper behavior. Thus he established the standard etiquette. In this way I have described Damodar Pandit's verbal chastisements. As one hears about this, atheistic principles and ignorance depart. The pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu are deeper than millions of seas and oceans. Therefore no one can understand what he does nor why he does it. I do not know the deep meaning of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's activities. As far as possible I shall try to explain them externally. One day Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu met Haridas Thakur as usual, and in the course of discussion he inquired as follows, 
My dear Thakur Haridas, in this age of Kali most people are bereft of Vedic culture, and therefore they are called Yavanas. They are concerned only with killing cows and Brahminical culture. In this way they all engage in sinful acts. How will these Yavanas be delivered? To my great unhappiness I do not see any way. Haridas Thakur replied, My dear Lord, do not be in anxiety. Do not be unhappy to see the condition of the Yavanas in material existence, because the Yavanas are accustomed to saying Ha Ram, Ha Ram, or O Lord Ram Chandra, they will very easily be delivered by this Nama Bas. A devotee in advanced ecstatic love exclaims, O my Lord Ram Chandra, O my Lord Ram Chandra. But the Yavanas also chant Ha Ram, Ha Ram. Just see their good fortune, even though they think those words mean abominable. Namacharya Haridas Thakur, the authority on the chanting of the holy name, said, The chanting of the Lord's holy name to indicate something other than the Lord is an instance of Nama Bas. Even when the holy name is chanted in this way, its transcendental power is not destroyed. Even a Malecha who is being killed by the tusk of a boar and who cries in distress again and again, Haram, Haram, even he attains liberation. What then to speak of those who chant the holy name with veneration and faith? Ajamil was a great sinner during his life, but at the time of death he accidentally called for his youngest son, whose name was Narayan and the attendants of Lord Vishnu came to relieve him from the bonds of Yamaraj, the superintendent of death. The word Ram consists of the two syllables Ra and Ma. These are unseparated and are decorated with the loving word Ha, meaning O. Oh. The letters of the holy name have so much spiritual potency that they act even when uttered improperly. As mentioned in the Padma Purana, if a devotee once utters the holy name of the Lord, or if it penetrates his mind or enters his ear, which is the channel of oral reception, that holy name will certainly deliver him from material bondage, whether vibrated properly or improperly, with correct or incorrect grammar, and properly joined or vibrated in separate parts. O Brahman, the potency of the holy name is therefore certainly great, However, if one uses the vibration of the Holy Name for the benefit of the material body, for material wealth and followers, or under the influence of greed or atheism, in other words, if one utters the name with offenses, such chanting will not produce the desired result very soon. Therefore, one should diligently avoid offenses in chanting the Holy Name of the Lord. If one offenselessly utters the holy name even imperfectly, one can be freed from all the results of sinful life. Quoting the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, he continued, O reservoir of all good qualities, just worship Sri Krishna, the purifier of all purifiers, the most exalted of the personalities worshipped by choice poetry. Worship him with a faithful, unflinching mind, without duplicity and in a highly elevated manner. Thus worship the Lord, whose name is like the sun, for just as a slight appearance of the sun dissipates the darkness of night, so a slight appearance of the holy name of Krishna can drive away all the darkness of ignorance that arises in the heart due to greatly sinful activities performed in previous lives. Even a faint light from the holy name of the Lord can eradicate all the reactions of sinful life. While dying, Ajamil chanted the holy name of the Lord, intending to call his son Narayan. Nevertheless, he attained the spiritual world. What then to speak of those who chant the holy name with faith and reverence? Because of even the faintest rays of the effulgence of the Lord's holy name, one can attain liberation. We can see this in all the revealed scriptures. The evidence appears in the story of Ajamil in Srimad Bhagavatam. As Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu heard this from Haridas Thakur, 
the happiness within his heart increased, but as a matter of course, he still inquired further. He said, On this earth there are many living entities, some moving and some not moving. What will happen to the trees, plants, insects, and other living entities? How will they be delivered from material bondage? Haridas Thakur replied, My dear Lord, the deliverance of all moving and non-moving living entities takes place only by your mercy. You have already granted this mercy and delivered them. You have loudly chanted the Hare Krishna mantra, and everyone, moving or not moving, has benefited by hearing it. My Lord, the moving entities who have heard your loud Sankirtan have already been delivered from bondage to the material world. And after the non-moving living entities like trees hear it, there is an echo. Actually, however, it is not an echo. It is the kirtan of the non-moving living entities. All this, although inconceivable, is possible by your mercy. When loud chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra is performed all over the world by those who follow in your footsteps, all living entities, moving and non-moving, dance in ecstatic devotional. My dear Lord, all the incidents that took place while you were going to Vrindavan through the forest known as Jarakanda have been related to me by your servant Balabhadra Bhattacharya. When your devotee Vasudev Dutt submitted his plea at your lotus feet for the deliverance of all living entities, you accepted that request. My dear Lord, you have accepted the form of a devotee just to deliver all the fallen souls of this world. You have preached the loud chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and in this way freed all moving and non-moving living entities from material bondage. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu replied, If all living entities were liberated, the entire universe would be devoid of living beings. Haridas replied, My Lord, as long as you are situated within the material world, you will send to the spiritual sky all the developed moving and non-moving living entities in different species. Then again you will awaken the living entities who are not yet developed and engage them in activities. In this way, all moving and non-moving living entities will come into existence and the entire universe will be filled as it was previously. Previously, when Lord Ramachandra left this world, he took with him all the living entities of Ayodhya. Then he filled Ayodhya again with other living entities. My dear Lord, you have set a plan in motion by descending on the material world, but no one can understand how you are acting. Formerly, when Lord Krishna descended in Vrindavan, he freed all living entities in the universe from material existence in the same way. As the Srimad Bhagavatam says, Krishna, the unborn Supreme Personality of Godhead, Master of all the masters of mystic power, delivers all living entities, moving and non-moving. Nothing is astonishing in the activities of the Lord. Although the Supreme Personality of Godhead may be seen, glorified or remembered with an attitude of envy, He nevertheless awards the most confidential liberation which is rarely achieved even by the demigods and demons. What then can be said of those who are already fully engaged in devotional service to the Lord? By descending as an incarnation at Navadvip, you, just like Krishna, have already delivered all the living entities of the universe. One may say that he understands the glories of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He may know whatever he may know, but as far as I am concerned, this is my conclusion. My dear Lord, your pastimes are just like an ocean of nectar. It is not possible for me to conceive how great that ocean is or even to understand a drop of it. Hearing all this, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was astonished. These are actually my confidential pastimes, he thought. How could Haridas have understood them? Greatly satisfied by the statements of Haridas Thakur, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu embraced him. Outwardly, however, he avoided further discussions of these matters. 
This is a characteristic of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Although he wants to cover his opulence, he cannot do so before his devotees. This is well known everywhere. In the Strotra Ratna of Yamunacharya it is said, O my Lord, everything within material nature is limited by time, space, and thought. Your characteristics, however, being unequaled and unsurpassed, are always transcendental to such limitations. You sometimes cover such characteristics by your own energy, but nevertheless, your unalloyed devotees are always able to see you under all circumstances. Then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu went to his personal devotees and began speaking about Haridas Thakur's transcendental qualities as if he had hundreds of mouths. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu derives great pleasure from glorifying his devotees, and among the devotees Haridas Thakur is the foremost. The transcendental qualities of Haridas Thakur are innumerable and unfathomable. One may describe a portion of them, but to count them all is impossible. In Chaitanya Mangal, Srila Vrindavan Das Thakur has described the attributes of Haridas Thakur to some extent. No one can describe all the qualities of Haridas Thakur. One may say something about them just to purify himself. O devotees of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, please hear something about the qualities of Haridas Thakur that Srila Vrindavan Das Thakur has not described in detail. After leaving his home, Haridas Thakur stayed for some time in the forest of Benapul. Haridas Thakur constructed a cottage in a solitary forest. There he planted a Tulsi plant, and in front of the Tulsi he would chant the holy name of the Lord three hundred thousand times daily. He chanted throughout the entire day and night. For his bodily maintenance he would go to a Brahmin's house and beg some food. He was spiritually so influential that all the neighboring people worshipped him. A landholder named Ramachandra Khan was the zamandar of that district. He was envious of Vaishnavs and was therefore a great atheist. Unable to tolerate that such respect was being offered to Haridas Thakur, Ramachandra Khan planned in various ways to dishonor him. By no means could he find any fault in the character of Haridas Thakur. Therefore he called for local prostitutes and began a plan to discredit His Holiness. Ramachandra Khan said to the prostitutes, There is a mendicant named Haridas Thakur. All of you devise a way to deviate him from his vows of austerity. Among the prostitutes, one attractive young girl was selected and said, I shall attract the mind of Haridas Thakur within three days. Ramachandra Khan said to the prostitute, My constable will go with you so that as soon as he sees you with Haridas Thakur, immediately he will arrest him and bring both of you to me. First, let me have union with him once. Then the second time I shall take your constable with me to arrest him. At night, the prostitute, after dressing herself most attractively, went to the cottage of Haridas Thakur with great jubilation. After offering obeisances to the Tulsi plant, she went to the door of Haridas Thakur, offered him obeisances, and stood there. Exposing part of her body to his view, she sat down on the threshold of the door and spoke to him in very sweet words. My dear Thakur, O oh, great preacher, great devotee, you are so beautifully built, and your youth is just beginning. 
Who was the woman who could control her mind after seeing you? I am so eager to be united with you. My mind is greedy for this. If I don't obtain you, I shall not be able to keep my body and soul together. Haridas Thakur replied, I shall accept you without fail, but you will have to wait until I have finished chanting my regular rounds on my beads. Until that time, please sit and listen to the chanting of the holy name. As soon as I am finished, I shall fulfill your desire. Hearing this, the prostitute remained sitting there while Haridas Thakur chanted on his beads until the light of morning appeared. When she saw that it was morning, the prostitute stood up and left. Coming before Ramachandra Khan, she informed him of all the news. Today, Haridas Thakur has promised to enjoy with me. So tomorrow, tomorrow, certainly I shall have union with him. The next night, when the prostitute came again, Haridas Thakur gave her many assurances. Last night you were disappointed. Please excuse my offense. I shall certainly accept you. Please sit down and hear the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra until my regular chanting is finished. Then, yes, then your desire will surely be fulfilled. After offering her obeisances to the Tulsi plant and Haridas Thakur, she sat down at the door. Hearing Haridas Thakur chanting the Hare Krishna Mantra, she also chanted, O oh, my Lord Hari, O oh, my Lord Hari, when the night came to an end, the prostitute was restless. Seeing this, Haridas Thakur spoke to her as follows. I have vowed to chant ten million names in a month. I have taken this vow, but now it is nearing its end. I thought that today I would be able to finish my performance of Jagya, my chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. I tried my best to chant the holy name all night, but I still did not finish. Tomorrow I will surely finish, and my vow will be fulfilled. Then it will be possible for me to enjoy with you in full freedom. The prostitute returned to Ramchandra Khan and informed him of what had happened. The next day she came earlier, at the beginning of the evening, and stayed with Haridas Thakur. After offering obeisances to the Tulsi plant and Haridas Thakur, she sat down on the threshold of the room. Thus she began to hear Haridas Thakur's chanting, and she also personally chanted, Hari, Hari, the holy name of the Lord. Haridas Thakur said, Today it will be possible for me to finish my chanting. Then I shall satisfy all your desires. The night ended while Haridas Thakur was chanting, but by his association, the mind of the prostitute had changed. The prostitute, now purified, fell at the lotus feet of Haridas Thakur and confessed that Ramchandra Khan had appointed her to pollute him. She said, Because I have taken the profession of a prostitute, I have performed unlimited sinful acts. Oh, my Lord, be merciful to me. Deliver my fallen soul. I know everything about the conspiracy of Ramchandra Khan. He is nothing but an ignorant fool. Therefore, his activities do not make me feel unhappy. On the very day Ramchandra Khan was planning his intrigue against me, I would have left this place immediately. But because you came to me, I stayed here for three days to deliver you. Kindly act as my spiritual master. Instruct me in my duty by which to get relief from material existence. All right. Immediately go home and distribute to the Brahmins whatever property you have. Then come back to this room and stay here forever in Krishna consciousness. Chant the Hare Krishna mantra continuously and render service to the Tulsi plant by watering her and offering prayers to her. In this way, you will very soon get the opportunity to be sheltered at the lotus feet of Krishna. 
After thus instructing the prostitute about the process of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, Haridas Thakur stood up and left, continuously chanting, Hari, Hari. Thereafter, the prostitute distributed to the Brahmins whatever household possessions she had, following the order of her spiritual master. The prostitute shaved her head clean in accordance with Vaishnav principles, and stayed in that room wearing only one cloth. Following in the footsteps of her spiritual master, she began chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra three hundred thousand times a day. She chanted throughout the entire day and night. She worshipped the Tulsi plant, following in the footsteps of her spiritual master. Instead of eating regularly, she chewed whatever food she received as alms, and if nothing was supplied, she would fast. Thus, by eating frugally and fasting, she conquered her senses, and as soon as her senses were controlled, symptoms of love of Godhead appeared in her person. Thus, the prostitute became a celebrated devotee. She became very advanced in spiritual life, and many stalwart Vaishnavs would come to see her. Seeing the sublime character of the prostitute, everyone was astonished. Everyone glorified the influence of Haridas Thakur and offered him obeisances. By inducing a prostitute to disturb Haridas Thakur, Ramchandra Khan caused a seed of offense at his lotus feet to germinate. This seed later became a tree, and when it fructified, Ramchandra Khan ate its fruits. This offense at the lotus feet of an exalted devotee has resulted in a wonderful narration. Taking advantage of the opportunity afforded by these incidents, I shall explain what happened. O oh, devotees, please listen. Ramachandra Khan was naturally a non-devotee. Now, having offended the lotus feet of Haridas Thakur, he became just like a demoniac atheist. Because of blaspheming the cult of Vaishnavism and insulting the devotees for a long time, he now received the results of his offensive activities. When Lord Nityananda returned to Bengal to preach the cult of Bhakti, love of Godhead, he began touring all over the country. For two purposes, to spread the cult of bhakti and to defeat and subdue the atheists, Lord Nityananda, the most dedicated devotee of the Lord, moved throughout the country. Lord Nityananda, who is omniscient because he is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, came to the house of Ramchandra Khan and sat down on the altar of the Durga Mandap. When the Durga Mandap and courtyard were filled with crowds of men, Ramchandra Khan, who was inside the house, sent his servant to Lord Nityananda. The servant informed Lord Nityananda, My dear sir, Ramchandra Khan has sent me to accommodate you in some common man's house. You might go to the house of a milkman, uh, for the cow shed is spacious, whereas the space here in the Durga Mandap is insufficient because you have many followers with you. When Nityananda Prabhu heard this order from the servant of Ramchandra Khan, he became very angry and came out. Laughing very loudly, he spoke as follows. <laughs> yes, Ramachandra Khan has spoken rightly. This place is unfit for me. It is fit for cow-killing meat-eaters. <laughs> Having said this, Lord Nityananda stood up and left in an angry mood. To chastise Ramchandra Khan, he did not even stay in that village. Ramchandra Khan ordered the servant to dig up the dirt in the place where Nityananda Prabhu had sat. To purify the Durga Mandap temple and the courtyard, Ramchandra Khan sprinkled and smeared it with water mixed with cow dung, but still his mind was unsatisfied.
Ramachandra Khan's business was questionable, for he tried to avoid paying income tax to the government. Therefore, the government's minister of finance was angry and came to his residence. The Mohammedan minister made his residence in the Durga Mandap of Ramchandra Khan. He killed a cow and cooked the meat at that very place. He arrested Ramchandra Khan along with his wife and sons, and then he continuously plundered the house and village for three days. In that very room, he cooked the flesh of a cow for three consecutive days. Then the next day he left, accompanied by his followers. The Mohammedan minister took away Ramchandra Khan's position, wealth, and followers. For many days the village remained deserted. Wherever an advanced devotee is insulted for one man's fault, the entire town or place is afflicted. Haridas Thakur walked until he came to the village known as Chandapur. There he stayed at the house of Balaram Acharya. Hiranya and Govardhan were the two governmental treasurers in that division of the country. Their priest was named Balaram Acharya. Balaram Acharya, being favored by Haridas Thakur, was very attached to him. Therefore he kept Haridas Thakur in the village with great care and attention. In the village, Haridas Thakur was given a solitary thatched cottage where he performed the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. He accepted prasad at the house of Balaram Acharya. Raghunath Das, who was the son of Hiranya Majumdar and was later to become Raghunath Das Goswami, was at that time a boy engaged in study. He came to see Haridas Thakur daily. Naturally, Haridas Thakur was merciful toward him, and because of the merciful benediction of this Vaishnav, he later attained the shelter of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's lotus feet. At the residence of Hiranya and Govardhan, discourses took place by which Haridas Thakur was glorified. O oh, devotees, please listen to that wonderful story. One day Balaram Acharya requested Haridas Thakur, with great humility, to come to the assembly of the Majumadars, Hiranya and Govardhan. Thus Balaram Acharya went there with Haridas Thakur. Seeing Haridas Thakur, the two brothers immediately stood up and fell at his lotus feet. Then with great respect they offered him a place to sit. In that assembly were many learned scholars, Brahmins and respectable gentlemen. The two brothers, Hiranya and Govardhan, were also greatly learned. Everyone there began to speak of Haridas Thakur's great qualities as if they had five mouths. Hearing this, both brothers were extremely happy. It was mentioned in the assembly that Haridas Thakur chanted the holy names of Krishna three hundred thousand times a day. Thus all the learned scholars began to discuss the glories of the holy name. Some of them said, By chanting the holy name of the Lord, one is freed from the reactions of all sinful life. Others said, Simply by chanting the holy name of the Lord, a living being is liberated from material bondage. Haridas Thakur protested, These two benedictions are not the true result of chanting the holy name. By actually chanting the holy name without offenses, one awakens his ecstatic love for the lotus feet of Krishna. The Srimad Bhagavatam says, When a person is actually advanced and takes pleasure in chanting the holy name of the Lord, who is very dear to him, he is agitated and loudly chants the holy name. He also laughs and cries, becomes agitated and chants just like a madman, not caring for outsiders. Liberation and extinction of the reactions of sinful life are two concomitant byproducts of chanting the holy name of the Lord. An example is found in the gleams of morning sunlight. As the rising sun immediately dissipates all the world's darkness, which is deep like an ocean, so the holy name of the Lord 
if chanted once without offenses, can dissipate all the reactions of a living being's sinful life. All glories to that holy name of the Lord, which is auspicious for the entire world. After reciting this verse, Haridas Thakur said, O oh, learned scholars, please explain the meaning of this verse. But the audience requested Haridas Thakur, it is better for you to explain the meaning of this important verse. Haridas Thakur said, As the sun begins to rise, even before visible, it dissipates the darkness of night. With the first glimpse of sunlight, fear of thieves, ghosts, and demons immediately disappears. And when the sun is actually visible, everything is manifest, and everyone begins performing his religious activities and regulative duties. Similarly, the first hint that offenseless chanting of the Lord's holy name has awakened dissipates the reactions of sinful life immediately. And when one chants the holy name offenselessly, one awakens to service in ecstatic love at the lotus feet of Krishna. Liberation is the insignificant result derived from a glimpse of awakening of offenseless chanting of the holy name. While dying, Ajamil chanted the holy name of the Lord, intending to call his son Narayan. Nevertheless, he attained the spiritual world. What then to speak of those who chant the holy name with faith and reverence? Liberation, which is unacceptable for a pure devotee, is always offered by Krishna without difficulty. Krishna says in the Srimad Bhagavatam, My devotees do not accept Salokya, Sarshti, Sarupya, Samipya, or oneness with me, even if I offer these liberations in preference to serving me. At the house of Hiranya and Govardhan Majumadar, a person named Gopal Chakravarti was officially the chief tax collector. This Gopal Chakravarti lived in Bengal. His duty as chief tax collector was to collect 1,200,000 coins to deposit in the treasury of the emperor. He had handsome bodily features and was learned and youthful, but he could not tolerate the statement that simply by glimpsing the awakening of the Lord's holy name, one can attain liberation. This young man, Gopal Chakravarti, became very angry upon hearing the statements of Haridas Thakur. He immediately criticized him. He said, O oh, assembly of learned scholars, just hear the conclusions of this emotional devotee. <laughs> <laughs> After many millions upon millions of birth, when one is complete in absolute knowledge, one still may not attain liberation. Yet this man says that one may attain it simply by the awakening of a glimpse of the holy name. Haridas Thakur said, Why are you doubtful? The revealed scriptures say that one can attain liberation simply by a glimpse of a fenceless chanting of the holy name. For a devotee who enjoys the transcendental bliss of devotional service, liberation is most insignificant. Therefore, pure devotees never desire to attain liberation. In the Hari Bhakti Sudodaya, it says, My dear Lord, O Master of the Universe, since I have directly seen you, my transcendental bliss has taken the shape of a great ocean. Being situated in that ocean, I now realize all other so-called happiness, including even Brahmananda, to be like the water contained in the hoof print of a calf. Gopal Chakravati said, If one is not liberated by Namabas, then you may be certain that I shall cut off your nose. Then Haridas Thakur accepted the challenge offered by Gopal Chakravati. If by Namabas liberation is not available, certainly I shall cut off my nose. All the members of the assembly who had heard the challenge were greatly agitated, and they got up, making a tumultuous sound. Hiranya and Govardhan Majumadar both immediately chastised the Brahmin tax collector. The priest named Balaram Acharya chastised Gopal Chakravati, saying, 
You are a foolish logician. What do you know about the devotional service of the Lord? You have insulted Haridas Thakur. Thus, there will be a dangerous position for you. You should not expect anything auspicious. Then Haridas Thakur got up to leave, and the Majumadars, the masters of Gopal Chakravati, immediately dismissed Gopal Chakravati from their service. With all the members of the assembly, the two Majumadars fell at the lotus feet of Haridas Thakur. Haridas Thakur was smiling, however, and he spoke in a sweet voice. None of you are at fault. Indeed, even this ignorant so-called Brahmin is not at fault, for he is accustomed to dry speculation and logic. One cannot understand the glories of the holy name simply by logic and argument. Therefore, this man cannot possibly understand the glories of the holy name. All of you may now go to your homes. May Lord Krishna bestow his blessings upon you all. Do not be sorry because of my being insulted. Then Hiranyadas Mujumada returned to his home and ordered that Gopal Chakravati not be admitted therein. Within three days that Brahmin was attacked by leprosy, and as a result his highly raised nose melted away and fell off. The Brahmin's toes and fingers were beautiful, like golden-colored champaka buds, but because of leprosy they all withered and gradually melted away. Seeing the condition of Gopal Chakravati, everyone was astonished. Everyone praised the influence of Haridas Thakur and offered him obeisances. Although Haridas Thakur, as a Vaishnav, did not take seriously the Brahmin's offense, the Supreme Personality of Godhead could not tolerate it, and thus he made the Brahmin suffer the consequences. A characteristic of a pure devotee is that he excuses any offense by an ignorant rascal. The characteristic of Krishna, however, is that he cannot tolerate blasphemy of his devotees. Haridas Thakur was unhappy when he heard that the Brahmin Gopal Chakravati had been attacked by leprosy. Thus, after informing Balaram Acharya, the priest of Hiranya Majumadar, he went to Shantipur, the home of Advaita Acharya. Upon meeting Advaita Acharya, Haridas Thakur offered him respect and obeisances. Advaita Acharya embraced him and showed respect to him in return. On the bank of the Ganges, in a solitary place, Advaita Acharya made a cave-like home for Haridas Thakur and spoke to him about the real meaning of Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita in terms of devotional service. Haridas Thakur accepted food daily at the house of Advaita Acharya. Meeting together, the two of them would taste the nectar of discourses on the subject matter of Krishna. Haridas Thakur said, My dear Advaita Acharya, let me submit something before your honor. Every day you give me alms of food to eat. What is the necessity of this? Sir, you are living within a society of great Brahmins and aristocrats, but without fear or shame you adore a lower-class man like me. My dear sir, your behavior is uncommon. Indeed, sometimes I am afraid to speak to you. But please favor me by protecting me from the behavior of society. Advaita Acharya replied, My dear Haridas, do not be afraid. I shall behave strictly according to the principles of the revealed scriptures. Feeding you is equal to feeding ten million Brahmins. Therefore, accept this Radha Patra. Thus, Advaita Acharya made him eat. Advaita Acharya was always absorbed in thoughts of how to deliver the fallen souls of the entire world. The entire world is full of non-devotees. How will they be delivered? 
Determined to deliver all the fallen souls, Advaitacharya decided to cause Krishna to descend. With this vow, he began to offer Ganges water and Tulsi leaves to worship the Lord. Similarly, Haridas Thakur chanted in his cave on the bank of the Ganges with the intention to cause Krishna's descent. Because of the devotional service of these two persons, Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu descended as an incarnation. Thus he preached the holy name of the Lord and ecstatic love of Krishna to deliver the entire world. There is another incident concerning Haridas Thakur's uncommon behavior. One will be astonished to hear about it. Hear about such incidents without putting forth dry arguments, for these incidents are beyond our material reasoning. One must believe in them with faith. One day Haridas Thakur was sitting in his cave reciting very loudly the holy name of the Lord. The night was full of moonlight which made the waves of the Ganges look dazzling. All directions were clear and bright. Thus everyone who saw the beauty of the cave with the Tulsi plant on a clean altar was astonished and satisfied at heart. At that time, in that beautiful scene, a woman appeared in the courtyard. The beauty of her body was so bright that it tinged the entire place with a hue of yellow. The scent of her body perfumed all directions, and the tinkling of her ornaments startled the ear. After coming there, the woman offered obeisances to the Tulsi plant, and after circumambulating the Tulsi plant, she came to the door of the cave where Haridas Thakur was sitting. With folded hands, she offered obeisances at the lotus feet of Haridas Thakur. Sitting at the door, she then spoke in a very sweet voice. My dear friend, you are the friend of the entire world. You are so beautiful and qualified. I have come here only for union with you. My dear sir, kindly accept me and be merciful toward me, for it is a characteristic of all saintly persons to be kind toward the poor and fallen. After saying this, she began to manifest various postures, which even the greatest philosopher would lose his patience upon seeing. Haridas Thakur was immovable, for he was deeply determined. He began to speak to her, being very merciful toward her. I have been initiated into a vow to perform a very great sacrifice by chanting the holy name a certain number of times every day. As long as the vow to chant is unfulfilled, I do not desire anything else. But when I finish my chanting, then I have an opportunity to do anything. So sit down at the door and hear the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. As soon as the chanting is finished, yes, I, I shall satisfy you as you desire. After saying this, Haridas Thakur continued to chant the holy name of the Lord. Thus the woman sitting before him began to hear the chanting of the holy name. In this way, as he chanted and chanted, the morning approached, and when the woman saw that it was morning, she got up and left. For three days she approached Haridas Thakur in this way, exhibiting various feminine postures that would bewilder the mind of even Lord Brahma. Haridas Thakur was always absorbed in thoughts of Krishna and the holy name of Krishna. Therefore, the feminine poses the woman exhibited were just like crying in the forest. At the end of the night of the third day, the woman spoke to Haridas Thakur as follows. My dear sir, for three days you have cheated me by giving me false assurances, for I see that throughout the entire day and night your chanting of the holy name is, it's never finished. Haridas Thakur said, My dear friend, what can I do? I have made a vow. How then can I give it up? After offering obeisances to Haridas Thakur, the woman said, I am the illusory energy of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. I came here to test you. I have previously captivated the mind of even Brahma, not to speak of others. Your mind alone have I failed to attract. My dear sir, 
You are the foremost devotee. Simply by seeing you and hearing you chant the holy name of Krishna, it has purified my consciousness. Now I want to chant the holy name of the Lord. Please be kind to me by instructing me about the ecstasy of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. There is now a flood of the eternal nectar of the love of Godhead due to the incarnation of Lord Chaitanya. All living entities are floating in that flood. The entire world is now thankful to the Lord. Anyone who does not float in this inundation is most condemned. Such a person cannot be delivered for millions of kalpas. Formerly, I received the holy name of Lord Ram from Lord Shiva, but now, due to your association, I am greatly eager to chant the holy name of Lord Krishna. The holy name of Lord Ram certainly gives liberation, but the holy name of Krishna transports one to the other side of the ocean of nations, and at last gives one ecstatic love of Krishna. Please give me the holy name of Krishna, and thus make me fortunate, so that I also may float in the flood of love of Godhead, inaugurated by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. After speaking in this way, Maya worshipped the lotus feet of Haridas Thakur, who initiated her by saying, Just perform chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. After thus being instructed by Haridas Thakur, Maya left with great pleasure. Unfortunately, some people have no faith in these narrations. Therefore, I shall explain the reasons why people should have faith. Everyone who hears this will be faithful. During the incarnation of Lord Chaitanya to inaugurate the Krishna Consciousness Movement, even such personalities as Lord Brahma, Lord Shiva, and the four Kumaras took birth upon this earth, being allured by ecstatic love of Lord Krishna. All of them, including the great sage Narad and devotees like Prahlad, came here as if human beings, chanting the holy names of Lord Krishna together and dancing and floating in the inundation of love of Godhead. The goddess of fortune and others, allured by love of Krishna, also came down in the form of human beings and tasted the holy name of the Lord in love. What to speak of others, even Krishna, the son of Nanda Maharaj, personally descends to taste the nectar of love of Godhead in the form of the chanting of Hare Krishna. What is the wonder if the maidservant of Krishna, his external energy, begs for love of Godhead? Without the mercy of a devotee and without the chanting of the holy name of the Lord, love of Godhead cannot be possible. In the activities of Lord Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the three worlds dance and chant, having come in touch with love of Godhead. This is the characteristic of his pastimes. The holy name of Krishna is so attractive that anyone who chants it, including all living entities, moving and non-moving, and even Lord Krishna himself, becomes imbued with love of Krishna. This is the effect of chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. I have heard from the mouth of Raghunath Das Goswami all that Svarup Damodar Goswami recorded in his notes about the pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. I have briefly described those pastimes. Whatever I have written is by the mercy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, since I am an insignificant living being. I have described but a fragment of the glories of Haridas Thakur. Hearing this satisfies the oral reception of every devotee. Praying at the lotus feet of Sri Rupa and Sri Raghunath, always desiring their mercy, I, Krishna Das, narrate Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, following in their footsteps. Shri 
This ends Chapter 3 of the Ankyalila, The Glories of Haridas Thakur. <laughs>